He was halfway to the ark, and he collapsed and died right there. All of his peers were thinking, how did he do that? <laughs> I mean, on Yom Kippur, in the presence of an entire congregation, on his way to the ark for, I mean, they were jealous. There's a very famous question, which I'm sure you've asked on a number of occasions. We celebrate Pesach. We can't get over it. God took us out of Egypt. He took us out of slavery. We are so grateful. We are so thankful. We can't get over it. 3,000 years later, we're still celebrating Pesach. The obvious question is, you're so grateful that he took you out of Egypt, who do you think put you in Egypt? He took you out of slavery. Which slavery? The one he decreed <laughs> that you should suffer from. So what, what sense does it make to thank him? You put, you put us in, you take us out. Why do we thank God when we recover from an illness? Who made us ill? The devil? I think this is a really important mental position. When a country sends its young men out to war, assuming that the king or the president is a mensch, hypothetical, <laughs> he sends them out to war because because that's what a government needs to do, protect its country, protect its people. But when you bring the troops home, it's a celebration. And you can ask the same question. You're getting so emotional, the troops are coming home. Who do you think sent them out? So what are you celebrating? If you really appreciate them coming home, why'd you send them in the first place? And if you sent them in the first place, I mean, something's not right here. But the difference is very real. When the king sends his men into, into war, it's a strategic thing. It is necessary for the following reasons, and it is a strategic, necessary response to a threat or whatever. When he brings them home, it's not more strategy, that's personal. When you discipline your child, that's a strategy, necessary, um, helpful, responsible, not personal. But when the child responds to the discipline and becomes a mensch, that's personal. That pleasure is personal, hopefully. So what is it? God sends us into Egypt. It's part of the strategy. You got to go down to lift up the world because you got to lift from the bottom. So you got to experience the lowest part of the world if you're going to make a difference. That's a strategic plan. But when you can finish the job and be free of that obligation, that for God is a personal pleasure. So when he sent us into Egypt, it was a, technic a technicality. When he took us out of Egypt, it was personal. And that's why we say in the Haggadah, we are so grateful that you took us out of Egypt, not by sending a messenger, not through an angel, not through a shaliach. You came to take. This was personal. So when we look at things that are painful in the world, it's not bad. It's not something that shouldn't happen. Why should it happen? Some strategic part of the vast eternal plan of turning a lowly world into the highest world. But when something positive happens, that's personal. So when something painful happens, we don't get depressed because 
must be necessary. When something positive happens, we celebrate because it's personal. Could it be personal the other way? He, he is in charge. But sometimes he has to do what it takes and sometimes he does what he loves. So what does it take to fix the world? Uh, you got to get your hands dirty. What does it take to celebrate a fixed world? That's personal. So let me, let me end with this little story. The thing that makes us unhappy is doubts. Doubt drains all your happiness. Uncertainty, when you live with uncertainty, there's no joy. <laughs> you don't have to strike out in order for there to be no joy in Mudville. If you have doubt that your team is going to win, you already have no joy. The best solution to regaining joy, focus on the things you have no doubts about. It is amazingly effective. Because we live in a world that actually encourages doubts. At the university, you're taught to doubt everything which is so unhealthy and unnecessary. This guy came to campus with a t-shirt. The t-shirt said, question all authority. Independence, question all authority. So he's walking with this t-shirt down the, down the street on, the camp, on campus, and another student is coming towards him, stops and reads his t-shirt. And he says, says who? <laughs> what, what, what is this? You are obligated and commanded to doubt everybody. Oh, really? Says who? What gives you the authority to tell me what to doubt? It's a silly position. Doubt is a totally unnecessary pain in life. We can go through life without doubt and we would be fine. You're missing nothing. Because most of the time when I say I doubt something, what I really mean is I have no idea. Ask me if there's life on Mars. Oh, I, I, I doubt it. No, I don't doubt it. I know absolutely nothing about it. And of that, I am sure. I don't doubt. I'm absolutely certain that I have no idea. And that's usually the case. When I say doubt, I don't really mean doubt. It just sounds more sophisticated than to say, I don't know. So get rid of doubts. How do you do that? Wake up in the morning and focus on the things you have no doubt about. I know it's becoming a very short list. <laughs> I used to say, Wake up in the morning and focus on the fact that you are a man or a woman. Let's try something else. <laughs> because now we have doubts about that too. It is, it is so <laughs> crazy, crazy. Focus on the things you have no doubts about. I had a woman in, in our program the Beis Chana program, years ago, back in the 80s. In the 80s. Everything I, sh I said, she said, well, you can't be sure. No matter what I said, it was like, you don't know that for sure. Maybe not. I said, who did this to you? <laughs> Do you like what I'm saying or not? What, what is this maybe? So finally I said to her, stop it already. Maybe, maybe. Maybe your mother is not your mother. You were switched in the hospital. She says, oh, my God. <laughs> I said, whoa, I didn't mean to add another doubt in your life. Focus on the things you know for sure at the beginning of your day 
and then do it again at the end of your day. Because the middle of the day, there are so many doubts. You can't live with that. Start your day on what you know for sure. Like you wake up in the morning and you say, I have my soul back. I didn't do that. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't do that. So, thank God, I have another day. And at the end of the day, focus on what you know for sure. What was absolutely right and what was absolutely wrong that you're not going to do again. Don't go to sleep with doubts. It brings your joy back. As the Gemara says, there's no greater joy than the resolution of doubt. So let me share with you a story, personal experience. I go into New York often. I live in Minnesota. Come into New York often. I have family, the Rebbe. I come in, this is back in the 80s. And uh, the office where the Rebbe's files are kept was being um, moved or changed, and they were moving the furniture. There was a storage room that they were going to turn into an office. So I helped out, and I'm wheeling this file cabinet on a two-wheeler, and a, a manila folder slips out. We pick it up. It has one letter in it, single letter, on stationery from a doctor in Manhattan. Now, the way the Rebbe answered his correspondence, hundreds of letters a day, is by writing his response on the letter that you sent. In the margins and on the bottoms, he would write his answer immediately, and then the secretary would type it up, and it would be a letter. But when the Rebbe wrote his answer, it was brief points, bullet points, A, B, C, D. We picked up this letter, and the Rebbe's answer was written in the margins. And here's what it was about. This doctor writes to the Rebbe, um, my friend and I decided to have a new Torah written. So we hired a scribe, and um, before you finish the last line, you make a big party, and you honor certain people to fill in the last letters, and then there's a chuppah, like a wedding canopy, and you carry the new Torah to the old Torahs, and the old Torahs are brought out to greet the new Torah. It's a beautiful ceremony and so on. And they decided to have the ceremony in Manhattan in the doctor's apartment. It's a very large apartment. One of the people they invited to this party was a young woman who at the party suffered an aneurysm and before the ambulance got there, she had passed away. This doctor is now writing to the Rebbe, asking, what should I tell the people who are asking me to explain this? He says, my faith is fine. I'm okay. But there are people, particularly students, who are asking me, how can this happen? A woman comes to a holy event the completion of a Sefer Torah, and dies? So you know when a person says, I have no problem, but my friend is asking. You, know, you get a little suspicious. Some guy once came to a Rebbe in, in Russia and said, Rebbe, my friend wants to know, how do you do tshuva for committing adultery? So the Rebbe said, why didn't your friend come and ask himself? He said, well, obviously he's embarrassed. So the Rebbe said, he doesn't have to be embarrassed. He can come here and say that he has a friend who wants to know. <laughs> so the guy admitted that it was him. The doctor gives himself away because his second question is, why did this happen in my apartment? He's all freaked out. Anyway, so here's the Rebbe's answer. There, there were five of us working there, and we sat down to read the answer, blown, blown away. Here's the Rebbe's answer. 
Point number one. Why do human beings think they can figure out God's thinking? Number two, the Torah tells us that we should try to understand God's thinking. So let's try. Number three, every person when they're born is given a certain amount of time. The angel announces exactly when the person is going to die to the minute. Most people, with very, very few exceptions, live out the life that they're given at birth. You have to do something really unthinkably heinous to shorten your life. I mean, after all, it's the angel announcing. He's not guessing. And you have to do something really magnificent to extend your life past the announced date. People pass on the time that they, were, that they were given. Point number four. When the time comes, the circumstances in which it happens is very meaningful. For example, a person far away from home where nobody knows him and he passes away, with that's not so good. Home, Surrounded by your family, people who care, much better. There was an old chassid from Israel who came to 770. He came to New York for Yontif. He was a special guy, and they honored him to open the ark for Kol Nidre. He was halfway to the ark, and he collapsed and died right there. He was in his 80s, and all of his colleagues... All of his peers were thinking, how did he do that? <laughs> I mean, on Yom Kippur, in 770, in the presence of an entire congregation, on his way to the ark for, wow. I mean, you got you, you, you to do something special. They were jealous. A few years later, Another man died in 770. Don't get the impression that it's a dangerous place. <laughs> but he died on Simcha's Torah in the middle of the dancing. And all the old guys there said, oh, that's even better. <laughs> you danced your way right into, right into heaven. You know, when you get to heaven, they ask you where you're coming from. Could be embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> Was it this very Hasidic, ultra-Orthodox guy decided that he wants to see what the other side lives, how they live. Sh shaves off his payas, shaves off his beard, takes off his tzitzis, takes off his yarmulke, goes to a nightclub. He comes out of the nightclub, he's trying to cross the street, he gets hit by a truck, and he dies. He comes to heaven, and he says to God, Come on. I've been good all my life. One night I misbehave, you have to kill me? And God says, Mendel, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> so when they ask you, where are you coming from? It doesn't matter what you did all your life. Just now, where were you? It can be embarrassing. Or could be pretty good. Where was I? I was dancing on Simcha's Torah and then my heart just gave out. Or I was on Yom Kippur and I was in the shul and I was... So it makes a huge difference. In fact, when a person is breathing his last breaths, every detail becomes magnified as we can imagine or can't imagine. So the Rebbe says in the letter, can you imagine how meaningful it was for this girl who could not, in her last moments, say Shema Yisrael Hashem Elikeinu Hashem Echad because she had an aneurysm. But she knew that the room in which she is dying has a mezuzah on the door and the mezuzah says Shema Yisrael Hashem Elikeinu Hashem Echad. So she knew that she was dying in a room surrounded by good people and doctors who tried to help her. 
There was a mezuzah on the door that said Shema Yisro, and her life was completing together with a Torah. So what should you tell your friends and your students? Tell them that they just saw a magnificent expression of divine providence. And in fact, according to the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, why did you decide to write a Torah in the first place? For her. This was her merit. Anyway, we sat there looking at this letter and we couldn't believe it. Why don't we see things straight? Why do we always have this negative assumption? See that? She went to a party celebrating a Torah and it killed her. <laughs> no, it didn't kill her. Why do we think so negative? So we're sitting there marveling. And by the way, the Rebbe said, concerning your second question, why did it happen in your apartment? Because you're a doctor. <laughs> And your job is to either heal people when you can or comfort them when they're dying. Usually you do it in the hospital, but this time it happened in your apartment because you're a doctor. Don't freak out. So we're sitting there marveling at this. The phone rings. The story's not over. There's a rabbi on the other, on the other line. He's panicked. He's in the middle of a bar mitzvah for his son. He's got hundreds of guests at the party. And his father, the boy's grandfather, had come in from out of town and was getting up to speak. And he had a heart attack and died at the bar mitzvah. And this man is, is, is panicked. He says, I don't know what to do. Ask the Rebbe, please. What, should I call off the bar mitzvah? Send everybody home? Finish, what, what do I do? We said, you got a pen? Take this down. And we read the letter to him. And he went and read it to the, to the entire community at this bar mitzvah. And people walked away amazed and inspired. Now we're sitting there thinking, can you believe this? The letter falls out. It's 10 years old or 15 years old, the letter. It falls out just in time for us to convey it to this man who needed to know. Isn't that amazing? Divine providence. And then we looked at each other and was like, who decided to move furniture all of a sudden? And I can tell you that to this day, that room never became an office. After that day, the, the interest in changing the room, when, I don't know, nobody really changed it. It was all for that letter to fall out so that we... If you have any doubts, remind yourself that nothing moves, nothing shakes, nothing changes unless there's a reason. And that's even little things. The Gemara says, there is no blade of grass that doesn't have an angel appointed to it that beats it and says, grow. Otherwise, it wouldn't grow. So nothing happens automatically. Nothing happens purposelessly. Certainly nothing happens accidentally. Everything that happens, happens because there's a reason. And it's the reason that makes it happen. Without that reason, it couldn't happen. If we can be reassured that no matter how painful, and no matter how tragic, and no matter how angry we are about what's happened, it's meant to happen. No doubts. So we have no doubt that it's meant to happen, and we have no doubt that we don't like it, that we object to it. And that's why we ask God to stop, fix it, heal the sick, feed the poor, 
and we do whatever we can to heal the sick and feed the poor. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic and you're looking for more information or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. These ideas, these messages, this approach to life, this approach to Torah, to meaning, and to morals is vital for the world today. And we need to get this message out to the entire world. It is universal. It's essential. It's indispensable. To support this effort, if you want to be a partner in this crime, check out the link and make a donation. It really helps a lot. And thank you in advance.